two guys and some horror. Tonight's episode's a very special one where we talk about a movie from 1987, a childhood favorite of mine, The Gate. Starring today's... Uh... <laughs> Oh boy, I really love it when I flub up the intro here, Curtis. Uh, what do you think? This is Curtis, one of the co-hosts of the show. I am Clark. <laughs> I think you're doing great. Keep going. I, you know, the anxiety gets to me, and I just, I'm not the best at this, but we, I appreciate you guys supporting and listening to us. So we, we're talking about the gate today. Um, Curtis had, has never seen it. I, every time I mentioned it to Curtis, he would he he'd roll his eyes and he kind of like move his head to the side, kind of like, uh, well, I, I like good child horror movies like Monster Squad or Gremlins. And uh, I finally got you to watch it, Curtis. Yeah, I, I finally got you to watch I'm it. so sorry, Clark, that I've, I've told you no so many times and pushed this movie off for so long because while watching this movie, I realized I've been missing out on a very very good classic uh kids fight evil horror movie and i i am so sorry i'm sorry i i think uh on a scale from et oh mac and me to et where would you scale this on childhood classics so like coming uh, into it fresh as an adult well one you dated yourself two i don't think i've ever seen mac and me Yes, I have seen Mac and Me. Have you? No, no, I'm saying I don't think I have. I think oh, that man. was a little oh. before me. Oh, no, 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 my friend. Mac and Me was around the E.T. craze. Yeah, but I barely so. saw E.T. Oh, damn. Yeah. Damn. I'm more of uh, Ernest Scared Stupid age, kid. That's the same age, though. I don't know. I feel like there's a little bit, like there's a one or two year gap there that I just... Don't mesh right. up with you on. I think we found our buffer. That's pretty good. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. But I mean, if I had to guess, um, E.T. is not really scary, right? It's just kind of a fun kids movie. There's some elements of scariness if you're super young, I guess. But right. for the most part, it's just a really fun, uh, loving story. This has some true elements of horror uh, that would scare the shit out of any kid super young. Yeah. No, I uh, movie terrified me, especially the scene with the the arm, where uh, yeah the aliens like they they close the door on the demons, but one of the little demons' arms and the arm just falls out the door and then just kind of explodes and like little snails and they all like move around and they go under the door. Um, it was the 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 attention to detail and the effects of this movie that even to this day are pretty impressive. Um, if not a little goofy looking in certain areas. Yeah, I really like the way they did um, the little little demons. Right. 100% agree with you there. Uh, so, I, I, I can't. So, this movie, like, it was originally made in 1987. This is a Canadian movie. Um, I, I don't think I saw this until it was it was on TV quite a bit when I was a kid. So I, I'd, I've seen this, I think it was like on TNT or USA or something along those lines. But this movie uses uh, puppets. Um, not like it uses like not, not just puppets, but also people dressed up in like full grown suits that look exactly like the puppets. And they just like run around. And it's how they kind of maintain this lifelike feeling of the monsters back in the, uh, the late 80s. Like all the monsters look pretty great, except for that final one, which you can tell is kind of a claymation. Yeah, the uh, forced perspective, I think, is what you're going for there with the the small de demonic uh, minions. And it's so I listened to a uh, interview as I tend to whenever it comes to these movies, and I really enjoyed um, the effects guy talking about how. Uh, you know, the, the director or the writer or somebody came in and was like, hey, we're making a mask for these demons. We really want you guys to build these suits. Um, and he they painted the picture of what they should look like. Uh, so I, I believe it because it, the director is the the writer is the one who wrote the story based on a nightmare that he had, I think. 
So anyways, he comes in and he's like, hey, this is what they look like to me. So the, the effect specialists didn't really have to do a lot. Like there wasn't a lot that they had to think about or ask questions on or take the liberties to change. They just made it based on the description he had. And that's that's what those little minions were that we got. And they said it was mm-hmm. a lot of fun to work on these suits because they didn't have to worry about the face so much because the masks were already pre-made for them. So they just built the rubber suits and then grown adults got in them. And then they shot it in that forced perspective uh, view mm-hmm. uh, with Stephen Stephen Dwarf. And that's how, you know, they, have, they, they got that effect, which it's really neat. It's cool, especially because... I mean, any movie that's done before good CGI, um, you know, practical effects are always so much nicer whenever they they look good. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of times practical effects look too cheesy or whatnot. I think they did pretty damn good in this movie. Right? No, I completely agree with you. Here. I a lot of the the actors in this movie are they're they're still working. Uh, by the way, uh, the only one who who kind of isn't is the guy who played the redhead Terry. Oh, uh, yeah, Lewis Tripp. So I have a little yeah, I have a little drop so, or write down for all the stars whenever you want to go through so, each of them. Oh no no no! I want to talk about Lewis Tripp specifically. Okay. Like, there's uh, there's some cool things that that kind of I, I back in the day I went on a little deep dive in this movie and I followed like all the actors and this guy's a uh, Kind of interesting because the sequel to this movie stars him, mm-hmm. uh, the redheaded character, and it is, it is such a bad movie in such a, a delightful way that I'm surprised it hasn't caught on more in the underground world. And we're gonna have to talk about that in the future, my friend. Heck, heck yes. But anyhow, moving on, we'll uh, kind of going through some of this cool stuff, the production, the value of this movie. They they uh, spent about 2.5 million. Canadian dollars estimated and it about opening weekend here in the United States. It was about $4.25 million. So they made a pretty nice gain from the film it was in no way a flop or a failure. Nope. They had a really so great I, uh, opening and I think still, yeah. you know, worldwide sales, they're doing really well as well. So to kind of explain to the audience what, what this film is, this is, I, uh, Kind of, if we do like a Clark's quick review on this, it it would be Clark saying, "Yeah, this is a child's imagination movie. Um, no matter what happens in the film, it all becomes undone in the end." Spoilers, um, as like a lot of these kind of childish movies were like, like Monster Squad had a kind of a similar ending when the monsters all went away, like things just magically repaired themselves. Uh, but this kid, he. His dad removes, gets a tree removed, and he and his friend are playing around the hall, and they find this geode, which unlocks this gateway to hell, and a bunch of crazy demonic hijinks happen. Curtis, what what are your thoughts so far? So, at this point in the movie, I'm I'm pretty interested uh, because of his nightmare and how he kind of already walked to the hole and and had that weird. I don't know. It, it was a dream as far as as far as we know as the, the viewers. But I'm pretty like sold. I'm like, OK, this is good. This is good. Uh, great start. Um, we're, we're getting invested here. We're understanding that something weird is going on with this tree. And then the next day, you know, he wakes up and walks outside. And like you said, the dad's having it removed and all that. And then we don't even it, go ahead. Sorry. We don't even know what like what ha- what's happening or what's even causing these these bad or scary things. Like, is it when the dad get to, takes the tree up because like he he has the nightmare then, right? Mm-hmm. And then he has friend, his redheaded friend Terry, and his sister and his dog, and those are the four main characters. Mm-hmm. The dog's always the best character. Um, like they go out to the hole, right? And they're playing in this room in this little like word. Is spelt out in his etch a sketch, little pen pad, and he yeah. reads it out loud, and then more weird stuff starts happening. But what yeah, actually? So when when did the forces it? of evil? Yeah, when did they start seeping into our world? Right? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Was yeah. it when they broke the geode? Is it because we see through a sequence of events like uh, later on in the film, like they're like, oh, this happened and this happened. Oh, it makes sense why the evil is being summoned, but. 
weird things have been going on the entirety of the film. Yeah, so I guess the best way to, for me, like as a viewer, as I was watching it, it kind of explained it to myself is like, he clearly had a tree house in this awesome tree. Yeah. And who knows how long that tree had been there growing, right? And mm -hmm. when the lightning struck it, something happened deep down below because we already had one broken geode that he finds whenever they're digging right. up the tree. So, like, if these geodes contained bad spirits or bad demons or whatever it is, right, one definitely got out that day <laughs> if they were in these geodes. And then sure. who knows how many more down there were already broken or whatnot. Um, also, that tree could have been a sealed door to hell. I don't know. Like, that would be kind of cool. But this is purely just me speculating and, and forming these ideas in my own head because I don't think they ever really explain the hole and how it came to be and what what really was on the other side of that hole, right? Is hell down there? I don't remember them ever really clearing that up. Do you? No, I mean, the all we have to go off of in this film for any sort, sort of a knowledge of what these demons are, are the, like lyrics from this record that Terry somehow has. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Deathgasm, like, right? De Deathgasm, pretty much. <laughs> I, I kind of feel like Deathgasm took a took a nod from this film they had to i really yeah. do i i mean there's um, so many things like that but um this movie does it that, really well that metal music by the way is so terrible uh for those in the audience there's a scene where terry is rocking out in his bedroom with with the main character and uh he his band what was it like uh death pony or something oh, dude, i don't quiz me on the name of that band right now i have no it, idea it's it's terrible. It's it's as if I were to if I sang like this the whole time. It was it was a bit rough. Bad vocal. It was so bad. It's just the, the guitar was pretty decent, but there's no way no kid would be rocking out to that music. Well, so apparently I mean, his dad gets him a lot of this stuff, and you can tell he's like kind of in a broken home because it's just him and his dad he misses his mom as we find out later on there's some his dad's never home yeah, yeah his dad's never around and his mom's clearly gone like gone gone um we don't know if she's dead or if she just left or divorced who knows but he's got you know he misses his mom you could tell and then uh he, well the he's... dad even pulls the main character aside and he's like your friend's kind of fucked up so just be patient with him yeah yeah i mean everyone can kind of oh. tell terry's got some shit going on I already failed. You didn't fail. You did your best, and we're at the twenty-minute mark. I, I really, I commend you. <laughs> I commend you. You did good. Um, just, just for the listeners, like this, this is uh, an adult podcast conversation, right? So there is cursing. Um, but Clark and I, I, I'm doing my best. Clark and I beforehand, we're we're uh, talking, and he goes, "I'm going to try to be as clean as I can today. This is going to be a clean." kid-friendly episode as we're talking about a horror film and uh and i go okay i'll do my best i've already said shit i said shit probably 10 minutes ago and clark lasted till 20 minutes and finally dropped an f-bomb like give that guy a round of applause please viewers listeners please, get, just please, give, please. give him a round of applause this <laughs> is great that's uh that's i don't know if i should be offended at that explanation give him a round of applause for not swearing for he 20 tried minutes. he tried so hard Lovely. and and no one, no one's asking him not to curse. Okay, no one's asking Slave him. Slave to my habits. <laughs> All right, let's <laughs> let's try I'm to get let's try to let's, get, <laughs> let's start now. <laughs> let's try to get back on track with we the were, story. Uh, so we're talking about this kid's parents. His mom's gone. And, yeah. yeah, the fact that he's solo and his dad. You could tell that his dad's like an absentee parent, right? And mm -hmm. his dad probably thinks he's doing his best. Whatever. We're not here to judge that. We're here to judge the content he's giving his kid. So he gives his kid like some crazy rock metal stuff from another uh, uh, country, right? They're an English rock group, I think. And he brought it back or something like that. But they're basically um, on the albums. They're explaining to you this old Satanism stuff or whatever it is, some demonology that's going on in, the, in this book. And the lyrics came from some sp spiritual demonism book as well and that's how they got these songs so the songs that they're singing are these old like um i don't know i don't even know what you would call them like proverbs about demons or something 
and it just sounds like something you wouldn't want to give to your kid um, if you knew what it was. So most likely his dad didn't actually know what he was giving his kid. He just thought, ah, it's some rock music from whatever. Well, Terry is into it, and he is into it deep. Like, just look at his bedroom. Look at all those posters, which I think a lot of these bands were made up for the sake of this film. But back on track. So some yeah, of the yeah. some of the bands uh, are actual Canadian bands on his jacket. I know that. Mm-hmm. Um, they talked about that in one of the interviews, and I know there's some IMDb fun facts and trivia about that out there. But, like, he had some, like, weird dwarf something rather patch on the back that's a a band in canada that's... go ahead no no yeah that was one of them yeah so i know i know there's a few of the patches that he was wearing that the um you know it's a canadian film so they were trying to bring some canadian love and and life to the to the movie so um all around in my opinion all around great character designs great costume designs like i definitely felt like this movie was in Canada, even though it wasn't shot in Canada. Um, uh, yeah. I, I thought they did a really very, good job. Very, uh, very Canadian talk in the film too. Yeah, yeah. The uh, parrots were were kind of great. Let's talk about let's talk about a little bit about the uh, the demons though for a second because okay. they uh, we don't really see the demons until a little bit like maybe a little bit before the halfway mark of the film, and they all look the same. But they have the ability to, to become a zombie, zombies, like merge together to become a zombie or a fake person mm-hmm. and kill your, your pets because that's obviously going to happen in a horror movie. Sadly. Um, I, like, I, I don't know. I thought this we made an agreement the other week that no more killing pets in horror films. I, I thought, yeah. did these people in 87 yeah, no. not hear us last week when we said, hey, no more but, killing pets? It doesn't matter because it doesn't really happen. It doesn't matter. No. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The, the movie ends in such a way or it doesn't matter. That's um, true. Everything, everything bad that has happened in this film is now undone. Uh, you get kind of a monkey paw thing. Very true. Um, so, well, so back to the, to the demons. I don't want you to lose your point. So you're talking about demons yeah. and how they... Pretty much all the demons towards the like the, the three last the last three quarters of the movie to the end are all the same, you know, size shape model. These weird little demons, but they do have some strange powers because the moths also are demons, correct? In a way, sure. they're, like they're they're some kind of a demon because they they're part of this main storyline of breaking into the house. Because then the monsters, those moths, go under the bed and try to grab the sister. They try to grab Al, and and I just remember writing that down as a note because that scared the hell out of me. Like that's to me where the movie really started to become a horror film is when these moths broke through that window. This this is where it really became scary to yeah. me. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a coming of age story that they yeah. kind of just masked like horror stuff on top of. Um, but I don't I don't know, man. I don't know how to explain any of the stuff in this film because he's. When there's a scene into where Terry's character, you know, we'll, we'll be cutting, cutting and moving around Lady HD, I guess, but he's walking down, he's going to get water or something, or he, he's looking for the bathroom and he sees his mom, his mm-hmm. dad, mom, or his estranged mom, or his whatever happened to her mom. And she's like, come down here, Terry. Give your mom a hug. And so he starts hugging and dancing with her. And all of a sudden, he's holding, like, the body of the main character's dead dog, and he just starts screaming. Like. So I'm glad they didn't take it in the direction I thought they were initially going to take it, where Glenn would blame Terry that Terry killed the dog. I mean, I'm, right. glad, I'm glad that that's not – it's what it felt like it could have went. Um, and, and, A, I, I'm glad Glenn's not – Glenn and Al aren't stupid enough to think that. That's good. Uh, but at the same time, like, man, what a scary moment as a kid, like going downstairs just to get a drink of water. You see your mom in a spirit form or if she looked real, whatever. She had that light. So, you know, she's not real. And he hugs her <laughs> and then he wakes up and she's dead. You know, the, the weird dead. stuff had already has already started happening in this house because, you know, mom and dad, they're out. They're out of town. They're like no parties. And right after they say that. Yep. Al throws a party. They're in a. 
there's a party and this party scene is what really sets the tone for uh for glenn i think to to not be upset with terry for the death of his dog that's a good point that's a very good point because when he gets levitated at, um, at the party you know they're doing the whole light as a feather stiff as a board use two fingers you know and they and they decide to use the little kid because it'll be easier so as they're levitating him, he like, you know, floats up a lot higher than where they're holding. So high, he ends up hitting the ceiling, destroying a, a ceiling fan, grabbing a light <laughs> fixture, pulling that down across the room, almost starting a house fire. And then everyone <laughs> the in the room friend. is freaking out. <laughs> the one, the one of the girls, none of them are freaking out by him. He starts crying and run off, runs off. And all of the teenage boys are like, look at that gay kid. He's, he's gay. <laughs> And just like you know, like the teenage insult thing, and yeah. then in the eighty and oh man, in the eighties, like we were, I think we text about that, right? We were like, so I guess you know, the eighties, they were just okay with that. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just the the one girl is like, yeah, I guess I won't make people fly anymore, and she's like all sassily acting like it was her. It's like, girl, girl, please. I mean, for all intents and purposes, she, it was her to her. Oh, she nailed that role. She did great. Yeah, she, I, prop, I think the acting in this movie, the best acting of the film. I, I think the acting in this movie for the most part was pretty good. Um, uh, it was, it was okay. Douchey guys uh, were a little. Glenn, thin. Glenn did not deliver his lines very well. Which is, is not surprising because this was his first film, right? Uh. You know, this guy has uh, he, he's been acting for a while. St Stephen Dorff. Yeah, no, St Stephen Dorff has a great has a great uh, film role. Um, yeah. I loved him in Blade. That's where I like first recognized the name. I was like, uh, that's Deacon Frost. OK, I'm sold. Yeah. Um, but no, I went I went digging in a couple of these uh, characters careers. And like you were saying, most of them s s had pretty good careers. Um, you know, Krista Denton. I think that's the sister. Um, she yeah. hasn't. She didn't Ow. do anything after 1990. So she'd be the only one in the list I'd say that like didn't really have much of a career. But uh, Lewis Tripp, I would argue. I'd say she had a much better career than. Uh, I mean, especially if she went through the 90s with the amount of work she had. Every no, year. literally dropped off around 1990. <laughs> so this yeah, was in 87 guy... to 1990. Right, right. But the person who played Terry, mm -hmm. uh, Lewis Tripp, he hasn't been in anything. Like, yeah, but he's, he's coming back this year. He's not coming back. I, we'll talk about that. We'll talk <laughs> about that, too. But he's not coming back. He's, he's reprising. So for the audience, uh, Lewis Tripp has only been in two movies where he's actually had a role, and that's in this movie, Gate, and Gate 2. Uh the, those are he was also in a TV series I believe but he's he's never really had um he hasn't done anything since except for like a, a little cameo in Detroit Rock City in 1999 mm -hmm. and after that he hasn't acted in anything until 2020 yes which will there's going to be a short um, where his character Terry is coming back, and the short's called the Sacrifice, so it might relate to this film, because I don't know. Like, I'm sacrifice... just excited to see. I'm just excited to see him coming back in something. No, one hundred percent. I'm excited to see him. I loved him. I, th I think he he has a very memorable face. Uh, he could be. He could fill a role in a lot of films. I just wish he would. You know, come back in acting because it's no. That's all I really want to say. I don't think he did that bad of a job. Though The Gate Two is possibly one of the best worst movies I've ever seen in my life. So, I really want to thank Terry for how bad of a job that movie. Ugh. Anyhow, back on topic. Back, back on topic. Back on topic. So the Lee Kid sisters. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, wait, wait. So <laughs> we have the levitation happened. Glenn's getting getting scared. He he sees uh at one point, I think it's they're still having the party, he gets levitated, the dog dies, 
Um, one of the, the teenage guys takes the dead dog's body back and he's like going to play a prank on Glenn. Well, he's supposed to take him to the uh, animal shelter, but the shelter was closed. So then, so then he takes him back to the house and then um, he buries him in the hole because he can't take him to the shelter. So he's like, oh, well, I'll just put him in this hole that's in the backyard. No big deal. Covers it up. Little did he know that that was one of the sacrifices um, kind of benefiting the, the demons. That's what I wanted to get into. Mm-hmm. So to summon the demons, you need blood. So Glenn, Glenn cut his finger when they were playing near the hole and he got some blood in it. They need the offering of the geode, broken geode, and then they need a sacrifice. And what else do they need? I think that was it, right? Yeah, and then to get rid of them, you need some an act of pure love or something like that. Yep. Which True throughout this movie, kiss. Throughout this movie, there's some relation between him and his sister when the two of them made a rocket and they used to be friends and fired off together. Which I thought was being... great. I thought that was great writing. Yeah. The That's idea the of what they call it, the silver, silver something. I don't know. It had a cool name. Um, but it's, it's I mean. What... Yeah, he literally references it the first, you know, five minutes of the movie and then continues to reference it all throughout. And I'm like, oh, my God, if this thing isn't the ultimate weapon to take down this demon, I'm going to be pissed because it's a complete waste of a story plot, which which it is. It is. (laughs) It is like he likes shooting off model rockets and he and his sister used to do it all the time together and which they no longer do. And the the best friend is kind of like, why doesn't your sister hang out with us? And he's like. She's lame now. He's like, I don't know. I think she's still pretty cool. Yeah, he just situation. has the hots for her. Oh, man. I bet he did. I bet he did. Terry. Terry was only hanging out with Glenn just to, just to really get close with Al and to show her that he's not so bad. But along the way, he and Glenn became best friends and in the future, lovers. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, I'm writing the fan fiction in my head as we speak. <laughs> All right. Look for those sales in the near future. Oh, Sponsored no, it's going to be for free. It's going to be on my live journal. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> Nobody knows what that is. <laughs> Nobody knows what that is. Uh, yeah, so demons start showing up. Mm-hmm. Terry's um, put together the clues, the true meaning behind the hole, the whole demon thing from the record, how to defeat the demons. We're back at the house, right? And I mean, all hell for all hell's breaking loose now at the house. Um, how how far do you want to take this one when it comes to the storyline? Do we want to go all the way to the end of this movie, or do we want to stop? Let's just talk about it. I'm just okay. like when they try to get rid of the demons, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even worry about it like that. May the old devils depart. May they burn in the fires of their own damnation. May they freeze in the infinite golden darkness of their own hideous creation. And Glenn's like, isn't that kind of insulting? And Terry's like, I, I think it's, it's supposed to it's be. It's supposed I, to be. They're isn't trying it? to get rid of them. <laughs> It's like, yeah, little bitches to the demons right in front of the hole, just like doing the whole X thing on their crotch. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was good. Up. It was good. Yeah, no, and then, then the demons are like coming in and they're like fucking shit up. The the friends Scooby Doo, like you get the Scooby Doo gang, and then the Scooby Doo gang leaves, and you have the main characters there, and there's a confrontation, and True Love wins. That's all this movie is, Curtis. It's all about true love and letting it in. Well, I, I mean, I love that they thought throwing a Bible in the hole was going to just be the end of it because it was like a grenade and blew it up. But, I mean, come on. Did you really think that's where the movie was going to end? Well, I like that they pull out the Bible and they're like, we have the Bible. That's going to save the day. The first like time I watched this in my adult life, I was like, I have my hand on my face. I'm like, please don't do this. Please don't do this. And they didn't, which is refreshing.
yeah, that's all there really is to say about that. I don't know. It's just when you pull pull the Bible out and then uh, religious symbolism, it, it gets too awkward. I mean, it's it's a pretty cliche thing to do, right? You got demons yeah. from hell. You've got a bunch of kids on earth. What do they do? Well, they go to the only thing that they know of on earth that can fight demons, right? They go to the Bible. Um, very similar to exorcisms and whatnot. Um, they they did the only thing that they thought they could do. But it didn't, I mean, it didn't work, right? So they throw the Bible in after reading passages, thinking that that was going to be the, the nail on the coffin. And unfortunately, it looked like it worked. And for them, they thought it had worked. Everything was moving forward plot-wise. Um, and so, so I, I mean, this probably is the best, I don't know, the, the, the best scare in the movie to me next to the monster under the bed. Because Al goes, right. Al goes upstairs to go to sleep. She's like, well, I'm going to go get some rest. And they're like, we can't sleep. That was crazy. We're going to go hang out in the basement. So they go in the basement. And they're watching a scary movie. And then some you know, worker man that they made up in their head pops out of the basement wall and takes Terry away. Like, yeah, that's yeah, just, yeah. That's the, just insane. The dead body. The urban legend monster man. Yeah. Yeah. They, they kept calling him the worker man. And, and Glenn's like, Terry just made him up. He's not even real. <laughs> And the demon, you know, because the demons obviously heard the story, so they, uh, you know, morphed into the worker man to to attack them. That's uh, so That's good. What I, just, I would do. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was awesome. So no, then, I, I, yeah, that's why I feel like this movie is this kid's imagination the whole time. I mean, it might be, it might be, because because he goes on he goes on the rampage. He he starts knocking each person off one by one, taking them with him. Right, so he takes Terry, he takes Al, and then. Glenn kind of saves her, but then goes to get the gun, and and then Zombie Terry pops out of the bag. Like what? My mind was blown at that moment. Like what the hell's going on? My ideal on? sequel. We're in the we're thirty years in the future now, right? And okay. thirty two years in the future right now from from the date this film was made. It came out. We have we have the sequel. It's Glenn in a straight jacket. In uh, in a in a state hospital. And he's he he's like detained, heavily sedated, and he's like he's talking about the demons coming back. And then the movie's just all about whether or not he's crazy or if there are actually demons there. Like in <laughs> that episode of uh, Evil Dead. And do we actually get to know the answer? No. Okay, well, that's not fun. I'll cut that part so that way the the listeners don't know. So when we release this movie. It still sells. Okay. Sounds Perfect. great. Perfect. All right. We just need funding You've and then we're good. You've been bad. <laughs> oh my God. That was, that was so annoying. They just kept saying that. You've oh. been bad. I'm surprised Maybe you that. didn't text me that right after you watched this. I should have. You should um, have. But you have, you've been bad. <laughs> Don't I, I, Don't I thought it. about it and I was like, no, nah, he wouldn't get it. He won't get it. He isn't. He's not cool enough to get it. He's not cool enough to be in the cool You've Been Bad Club. You've been bad. You've been bad. Yeah, it was a. Uh, so the kid's parents show up randomly in the street and they're not his parents. And then he like tears his dad's face apart. That's probably my favorite effect in the whole film. When he that just, was like, your favorite one? Dad. Okay. That that that's nightmare fuel right there, man. It is. It is. It's such a cheap but such a useful effect. It scared the shit out of me as a kid. I, I thought the phone melting into like a bloody mess was pretty good. That was great too. All of it, like the the effects in this movie are top notch. Because when you say nightmare, practical effects. Yeah, when you say nightmare fuel, I I mean, how many times in a dream have you gone to make a phone call and the phone melts into blood, like? That would know. scare the shit out of me, for sure. But either way, it was good. Both effects are great. The demon parents were awesome. Um, mm. But yeah, so so all that craziness happens, and we finally get we finally get the end of the movie, the real end of the movie, the callback to the Thunderbolt. That's the name of the rocket, Thunderbolt. And Glenn's been talking about it for the entire movie, <laughs> and we finally get it. <laughs> 
And then and he's uh, not allowed to fire it off without supervision, but he nope. fires it off without supervision to save the day. Not without getting those batteries out of the flashlight first. <laughs> oh. Man, right before I, he hops down the stairs, I go, why is he carrying that stupid flashlight around? He doesn't need it. And then as soon as he went to fire the rocket, and I go, oh, the batteries. <laughs> of course. You gotta have the flashlight for plot reasons. Don't get me wrong. This movie's great. There's this, those you know weird little like things that you're like, wow, that's forced. You know, you could tell it's it's a bit forced, and and that would be one of them for me. Um, but God, there's this movie. This movie was great. I'm so disappointed in myself for never seeing this movie until last week. I, I'm so pissed. It's a nice nostalgia flick for me. That's all it is. Yeah, I like I'm, it. I'm glad it's we could watch cute. it together. Fun facts and trivia. It's well, that time. About Let's talk about our buddy, Mr. Terry, Terrence Chandler. Let's do Lewis it. Lewis Tripp. So Lewis has been in, um, we, we talked a little bit about this already, but Lewis has been in three films. Um, the first one being this movie, The Gate. The second one being The Second Gate movie. And the third one as Nerdy Kid in Detroit Rock City. Yes. So apparently they're working on a very loosely spiritual tied spiritual successor to the gate called the sacrifice. Um, Curtis, what, what do you know about this that, that I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about. I know Terry's Terry's going to reprise his role or Phillip's going to Lewis is going to reprise his role as Terry, but uh, do you know anything else? All right. So all I've been able to dig up so far is a, it was initially set to release June 6, 2020. Um, it's an Australian film, and it's supposed to be a musical. Those are pretty much all the details that I could work up scrounging around on different websites like um, Fangoria. Um, what's the other one? Kilgore.com or something. And there's a couple of different horror sites that I like to go around through for news. That's all I could really pick up from different conversations where they've interviewed uh, Mr. Tripp and other people who are working on the the sacrifice altogether. With everything mm -hmm. going on though with COVID, um, I don't know if June sixth, like I don't know where they're at in production. If it's in post production, pre pre production, um, filming, in post. it's in post. According to according to IMDb, they are in post. That's beautiful because that means, if I remember right, post production, everything's been shot. They're literally just yes. doing edits and finalizing the film. So in theory, it's going to be like a direct uh, direct video type thing. So June 6 could still be a very realistic date for them. That's and that sounds awesome cuz I'd love to happens, see what they we'll... come up with. I'll have to check that out. I would be down to watch that <laughs> for the show. Amen. I my body is ready. So so is oh no, I'm not going to go there. Um you've been bad You've been bad. Uh, yeah, any other fun facts Steve and trivia? Uh, and I barfed on Steve Slavitt after the 12 minute run. <laughs> no, I, I think we're good there. Let's, cool. uh, let's, I guess we can plug, right? Or it's what it's have that you, time. What have you been up to lately? You know, um, so on shutter because we've all been, you know, stuck in at home. I've been watching their documentary series on cursed films and it is, it is phenomenal. Like they don't just talk about, okay, so it, it's, it's an episodic TV series, um, going over different films that, um, have cursed pasts or histories, right? So there's five episodes so far, um, in season one, they come out weekly and or they might be doing two a week i can't remember exactly how it's working but episode one was the exorcist episode two was the omen and episode three which i'll be watching probably tomorrow um is poltergeist now i watched the exorcist and the omen they don't just sit there and go hey 
the exorcist was you know cursed because of these these facts and these people's tellings and it happened this thing happened to this actor and linda blair had this issue during filming and you know so on and so forth whatever whatever like they definitely paint a picture of how you could potentially think that it might be cursed um, but they also have real experts in these fields these are people who actually get paid to investigate these types of things and you get to hear both sides i guess is my point where a lot of times documentaries um they just tell you yes this person is guilty or like the michael jackson one on hbo yes you know his little dude ranch was a pedophile uh, village whatever like they try to paint a picture you know what i mean and mm -hmm. what shutter's doing instead is they're giving you both sides of the coin and they're they're just raising a lot more questions than they're giving answers and then they're letting you as the viewer kind of make up your own decision on whether you feel like a movie was cursed or not so it's been phenomenal i've only watched like i said two episodes but they're really um popular horror films in the exorcist and the omen and then we get poltergeist which is the highest rating episode they have so far for the show out of the three episodes so I'm super excited for it on Shudder, um, and I have been tweeting about it as well, so if people want to see my opinion more um, about the different things, but man, it was it was so good. It was it was nice. It was a breath of fresh air. What have you good. been up to, my good man? I've been getting disappointed by uh, Amazon not delivering my packages to me instead handing it to my neighbor oh and no and it not showing up that's no, just kidding <laughs> that's uh no this is supposed to be yeah, the yeah. positive moment at the <laughs> at the end of the episode this is, this is the moment where all of the joy that i have to give is is rained upon all of our lovely listeners and unfortunately i am i pretty much don't have have anything to share i got uh the new final fantasy 7 remake and i it's okay i mean it's it's final fantasy 7 with slight changes it's, in story right no i wouldn't say slight like it's different it's completely different it's wow so some of the things they added i'm cool with some of them just like, oh man, you ruined the atmosphere of the game. Like, there's a point where, uh, so it's it's the original Final Fantasy VII. There's a portion of the game where Cloud has the cross dress. Um, it's a very well known part. And I'm, spoilers if you're you don't want if you're you're like, oh no, I am I'm gonna play this 20 year old video game. Uh, that I don't want getting spoiled for me. There's a, so to get Cloud to cross-dress, and if you want him to be cross-dressed very well, you have to enter this dance, weird dance competition thing where Cloud does some like weird K-pop movements and stuff, and it just it's really jarring and out of place. Just wasn't comfortable with it. it made me question things. Okay. So they added some. So they added that to the game and it just makes it feel kind of out of place and almost oh unneeded. man it, it is hilariously cringy it is bad it is just bad it's no i will send you a video of it and you can see for yourself okay because i got i mean i got to see a cool clip of um someone doing pull-ups i don't know who it is doing pull-ups but they're doing like a pull-up competition and you have to hit you know X triangle square circle X triangle square circle square, 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 square you know like the key combo thing um, like in a lot of games and I thought that was kind of neat because I don't remember Final Fantasy 7 really a whole lot my brother played it a ton and I know I've bought it on multiple platforms but I've never played it deep enough to really say uh, I know a lot about Final Fantasy 7 I absolutely love the game and I remember watching my brother play it a ton but personally like I've never I've never sat through it and I think here in the near future, once I get my head out of Minecraft, um, I'm going to have to give that thing a run through sometime and actually beat Good. the game. We're going to plug our shit. Time Check to us out plug on both. our shit. <laughs> Check us out on both Instagram and Twitter. Our uh, 
name, as it were, is the number two guys horror pod. And also feel free to reach out to us via email if you want to send us a, an electronic message. Tell us how much you you hate us, how smelly you think Curtis is, um, or any feedback you'd like. Uh, that email is the word spelled out, two guys and some horror at gmail.com. We uh, really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for listening to us. Uh, Curtis, do you have anything else to say to the lovely folks? Thank you guys for listening. Um, we've picked up a couple new countries, uh, you know, since we started recording uh, and doing episodes. So just for those of you at home, we are up to episode, we got some in the can, but this episode is 35. That's pretty, that's pretty big for us. Um, you know, we're doing weekly episodes and our listens are almost at 400 total listens. But our listeners are from all over the world. It's so cool to see this. We got people in Poland, Guatemala, the Netherlands, Australia, Chile, Ireland, Indonesia, oh, Canada, the UK, and the US. Um, all different kinds of platforms coming through. And Spotify even gave us some more data here that I didn't even know that they collected. Genders uh, and age. So, Clark, just so you know, we really hit home for the 28 to 34 year olds, just so you wow. know. Yeah. Look at that. Which is amazing because I fall right smack dab in the middle <laughs> of that of that span. Yeah, I am leaving uh, that. But that's, I mean, I appreciate every single one of you. I don't care, male, female, uh, non-binary, whatever it is, I love y'all. And I don't care about your age range. You could be 85 and love horror or you could be a six year old and love horror. If your parents let you listen to us, awesome. If you defy your parents and listen to us, awesome. I don't really care. It's, you know, we're here. We appeal to those who like horror. We don't appeal to those who um, don't. So I guess that's the easiest way to say it is if you like horror and you like us, we like you. And we're glad you're here and you're coming on this ride with us because we got a lot more episodes in the can. We were just actually discussing the next basically month of episodes that we're going to be doing and these are some of my favorite movies coming up. Not going to lie. Some of yeah, my favorites. Expect, uh, expect a lot of great movies. We're going to watch The Room. We've uh, kind of decided to change our def definition of horror. And uh, I thought Tommy Wiseau is just horror in general. Yeah, we're, we're totally yeah. doing it. Um, the worst horror movie ever made. That's that's coming up real soon. What the hell? Um, worst? All right. <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna fight <laughs> offline here, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Later. Curtis, I want you to tell me right now your feelings. I want you to express your emotions, the things you feel in the moment. Just, just let them all out. Let the therapy begin. Let the healing start now. Okay, I think we'll start right here. And uh, that, that's about it.